message this morning to take a look at Jeremiah chapter 40. I'll read for the uh, chapter for you, and then I think I'll read the first three verses of chapter 41 as well to round out the uh, events that uh, are considered here in this chapter. So, Jeremiah chapter 40. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah, when he took him bound in chains along with all the captives of Jerusalem and Judah, who were being exiled to Babylon. The captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God pronounced this disaster against this place. The Lord has brought it about and has done as he said. Because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey his voice, this thing has come upon you. Now behold, I release you today from the chains on your hands. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look after you well. But if it seems wrong to you to come with me to Babylon, do not come. <coughs> See, the whole land is before you. <coughs> go wherever you think it good and right to go. If you remain, they returned to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon appointed governor of the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people. For go wherever you think it right to go. So the captain of the guard gave him an allowance of food and a present, and let him go. Then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, at Mizpah, and lived with him among the people who were left in the land. When all the captains of the forces in the open country and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, governor in the land, and had committed to him men, women, and children, those of the poorest of the land who had not been taken into exile to Babylon, they went to Gedaliah at Mizpah, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniel, Yohanan, the son of Kariah, Sariah, the son of Tanhumeth, the sons of Ephi, the Netophathite, Jazaniah, the son of the Maakathite, they and their men. Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, swore to them and their men, saying, do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. As for me, I will dwell at Mizpah to represent you before the Chaldeans who, come, who will come to us. But as for you, gather wine and summer fruits and oil and store them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. Likewise, when all the Judeans who were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and in other lands heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah and had appointed Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, <coughs> governor over them, then all the Judeans returned from all the places to which they had been driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah. And they gathered wine and summer fruits in great abundance. Now, Yohanan, the son of Korea, and all the leaders of the forces in the open country came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and said to him, Do you know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nathaniel, excuse me, Nathaniel, to take your line? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, would not believe them. Then Yohanan, the son of Kariah, spoke secretly to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Please let me go and strike down Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he take your life so that all the Judeans who are gathered about you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah would perish? But Gedaliah the son of Ahikam said that Yohanan the son of Kariah, 
you shall not do this thing, for you are speaking falsely of Ishmael. In the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, son of Elishama, of the royal family, one of the chief officers of the king, came with ten men to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, at Mizpah. As they ate bread together there at Mizpah, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men with him, rose up and struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, with the sword, and killed him, whom the king of Babylon had appointed governor in the land. Ishmael also struck down all the Judeans who were with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and, all, and the Chaldean soldiers who happened to be there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the events of long ago, when you brought your judgments against the city of Jerusalem and against its people. We thank you that in these things you speak to us today and warn us of the judgments to come, and yet also point us to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who brings us deliverance, salvation, and new life. We pray, O oh Lord, that your blessing be on the ministry of your word, that you would watch over your elect. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the aftermath of the fall of the city, Jerusalem was in uh, upheaval. There was great confusion across the city streets as people uh, came to grips with the collapse of their city, uh, the uh, abandonment of the city by the king and his soldiers. Uh, the king was gone, the high officials were gone, leaders in the military were gone, the Babylonians had broken through and had begun systematically destroying the city. There were great crowds of people within the city who yet remained. And there was great confusion throughout the city as people tried to come to grips with what was about to happen. And also the Chaldeans, after taking the city, now they had to decide well, what were they going to do with the people in it. And the plan was to deport much of the population out of the city, bring them up towards Ribla to the north, and then transport them uh, back east to Babylon to settle uh, throughout Chaldea. In the midst of the confusion and the, the uh, <coughs> decisions being made there, Jeremiah was still in the city. God had spared his life. And God had also promised to recall the Ethiopian eunuch, Ebed Melech, that his life would be spared. In so doing, God gives us a, a, a glimpse of his great compassion for his elect in the midst of their afflictions. He spares his people uh, of great harm in, in this particular situation. What we will see, however, as we go on, is that God is pleased at times to allow his people to suffer along with the rest of the community and even to die. It will become apparent that Gedaliah, the new uh, leader appointed for Jerusalem and Judea, would himself be killed. A godly man put to death. And so our life in this world comes to us as a gift from God. And we live according to his good pleasure. We have a, as long as we live, we have a responsibility to live before God and to do his will in our midst. We're reminded of the Apostle Paul who wrote to the church at Philippi, as John has been explaining very clearly. Now, Paul was uh, torn between a choice of uh, departing from this life and entering into the presence of God, which would be far better, he said, to die would be far better, would be gain, or to remain on in the, on the earth, uh, which would be better for the congregations that uh, depended on him still for their growth and grace. And Paul understood that his ministry would continue with the congregations, and so uh, he looked forward to fruitful service uh, among the churches and a continued ministry there. God, some calls us to different paths, some to glory, some to service. In, in each case, uh, he strengthens us for the journey ahead. For Jeremiah, the, the confusion was rampant. There, 
when we look at the last chapter, in chapter 39, when Nebuchadnezzar had sent word through Nebuchadnezzar that Jeremiah was to be taken care of. He was to be taken out of the, the court of the guard and be uh, provided for, uh, conducted to Gedaliah and, and be under Gedaliah's care. When we come into this chapter, it seems that Jeremiah is among the captives making their way up to Ramah, which is a city, perhaps Ramah, a city of five or six miles north of Jerusalem. It's, they were beginning the, the journey uh, to uh, the, the north. And so uh, Jeremiah was among the captives. He was in chains, apparently, with the rest of them. You can imagine them, all these captives, uh, marching these long chains of, of people moving north, uh, eventually making their way east to Babylon on foot. Uh, and in their emaciated condition, that no doubt was a very uh, stressful situation for them. And what is more, undoubtedly, there are more than a few who passed away along the journey. When some commentators take a look at the, the account in chapter 40 and compare that with chapter 39, they think that, well, there, there seem to be some contradictions here and discrepancies between the two chapters. In chapter 39, he's released and entrusted to the care of Gedaliah, and yet in chapter 40, he's in chains and headed towards Ramah. And then uh, decisions are, are made at that point. Now, the outcome remains the same, that he's entrusted to the care of Gedaliah. It seems to me, along with Calvin and other conservative commentators, that you have uh, two accounts of basically the same thing. You have a, a more general account given in the 39th chapter of what would occur for Jeremiah. And here in the 40th chapter, we get into a little bit more detail. It's always, it seems to me, our responsibility as those who would be faithful to the scriptures and respecting the divine authorship of scripture that we take the text as it's presented to us there before us and try to understand it in, in, as it's given to us rather than just looking at the surface and saying, well, there seems to be some discrepancies and so there were dislocations in the text and contradictory sources and what you have is a haphazard, really, haphazard collection of various stories and pericopes that come together and form this anthology of snippets from the life of Jeremiah. And so you end up on, on modern uh, progressive liberal views of the Bible, skeptical views of the Bible, you, you end up with this uh, haphazard, hash, hash together uh, book, and it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense reading straight through it. And so you've got to have some commentator like John Wright or others who take a look at the text and say, well, uh, this text here, for example, in the 39th chapter, you had the comments of all the uh, officers coming into the city of Jerusalem and sitting at the gate. Well, that seemed to be a dislocation because it seemed to be abrupt in his mind and not a part of the fluid development of the text. In his mind, verse 4 should immediately follow verse 2. Verse 3 should be given over to later in the text. And modern scholars take Jeremiah and, and they shuffle it all up and mix things together. But God had an intention for the arrangement that he's given to us. There are thematic things that God wishes to communicate here. And yes, you can look at the, the end of the 39th chapter with Eben Melech and the word to him that God was sparing and say, well, maybe that goes more directly to the previous chapter when similar things were said to Abed Malek. But God has an intention for placing everything where it's at. There is a theological purpose behind it, and indeed a covenantal purpose, assuring us of God's provision for his people, even in the context of the great disruptions that were about to occur and were occurring. So here in, in this 40th chapter, I think there's no contradiction. Instead, what you have is a, 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 a more detailed treatment of what you have in the third of the chapter, where in the confusion of what was going on, the soldiers were just swept up Jeremiah along with others by mistake, put him in chains, and started marching him off with the rest of the uh, captives towards Ramah. And there, uh, 
the mistake was corrected. Uh, Jeremiah was uh, uh, pulled out from the, the, the uh, citizens there. And God, in a marvelous way, as Calvin uh, uh, addresses it, uh, Jeremiah is pulled out and, and in many ways singled out in front of all the Judeans there. And Jeremiah receives what is said here in the first verse, the word of the Lord. But it seems to me it comes through the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan commander. Now some will say that the word of the Lord really doesn't come until about the 42nd chapter, some distance away. I'm a little skeptical about that. It seems to me what you have here is God making use of this pagan commander to express his will to Jeremiah in front of all the Judeans. And God signals that his blessing, his favor is on Jeremiah before all the Judeans who rebelled against God and rebelled against his judgments. And Nebuchadnezzar then reaffirms really what Jeremiah had been saying all along, that God himself had brought this judgment upon the Judeans and on Jerusalem, and it was because of the rebellion against God that these things had occurred. And so now he presents to Jeremiah a choice, a decision. Jeremiah, we will favor you. You will not be required to go to the captives to Babylon. If you wish, you can go to Babylon, and there you will live in safety and in security. And that had to be a concern, in part because he had already been uh, telling people that uh, they must surrender the, to the Chaldeans, that they must uh, abandoned the city if they were to survive. And so some who remained in Judea and Jerusalem might have thought that Jeremiah was a traitor to the country. And so a, a, a decision to stay in Jerusalem might have put his life at hazard. But, uh, but Jeremiah um, took a look at the whole situation there and he, he came to his own decision. Uh, he decided rather than going to Babylon where there's safety, security, and perhaps a measure of prosperity under the care of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Jeremiah would return to Jerusalem, would return to his people, and identify himself with them in the midst of their afflictions. And he had a pastoral concern for them, a pr prophetic concern for that that the word of God would continue there among the poorest of the poor. It's quite likely that many who remained were among the godly <laughs> of those who remained. That many trusted in the Lord and they needed some pastoral care there. And by staying in Jerusalem, Jeremiah continued to express his faith in God's continuing purpose for Israel. God continued to have a covenant purpose for his people. In fact, God would continue to abide with his people, even in their most humble circumstances. To my mind, Jeremiah was following the example of Moses of long ago, when he had the choice he could stay in Egypt and flourish there in Pharaoh's court. But as the writer to the Hebrews reminds us that uh, Moses chose to identify himself with the people of Israel in all their afflictions rather than enjoy the sinful pleasures of life within Egypt. He considered uh, the afflictions of God's people of greater value than the riches of Egypt. Moses understood that the, the uh, comforts and pleasures of this world while maybe uh, taken advantage of in, in, in some good measure, uh, pale in comparison with one's commitment to God and his kingdom. And that if the choice is, at least for Moses, between service in God's kingdom and abandonment of that kingdom and enjoyment of the pleasures of the world, then for Moses, his intention would be to give himself over to the kingdom of God, come what may. Come what afflictions may come his way, he would nonetheless commit himself to God and his work. That's where the true value lies. Remember the parable that Jesus told of the 
man who uh, found a treasure in a field and he sold all that he had so that he might purchase that field and own that treasure for himself. There was the pearl of great price for which he sacrificed everything. There comes a point in time in our life when we must make a decision. Will we continue in this world and follow its various pleasures and comforts and uh, uh, joys? Or will we be willing to put those things aside, put ourselves at great risk by following Jesus Christ, following the scriptures, living in covenant communion with God and Christ and his church? There comes a time when we need to follow the Lord. And that begins when we first come to know Christ and we forsake the world because we have a reevaluation of all that the world has to offer. Remember Paul mentioned this in his own experience in Philippians chapter 3. I'm anticipating John here a little bit. But Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he looks at his former life, his status as a, a Pharisee, his great advance among the Hebrews, and the great prospects that had for him in the Jewish religion. Paul looked at all of that and he said, for me, it is rubbish. It's not worth it. It's all emptiness. All those traditions, all those works, all of the um, respect that would come my way as a devout Pharisee, he considered it not worth anything. It was rubbish, trash, dumb. You of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And for that, he gave up everything to follow Christ. For that, he followed him in spite of what hardships came his way. Now, some in our contemporary uh, church might consider that the only way that you can follow Christ is to enter into the ministry, enter into the mission field, and things like that. And that's not what I'm suggesting. It may be. But God calls you to uh, His vocation in all your separate callings in life. Whether it's as a, um, a doctor, an engineer, a nurse, uh, a letter carrier, a uh, mechanic. However God calls you in life, you serve Christ in that capacity. And so as a, in your job, in your home, in your family, and certainly in your church, you commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and serve Him as a believer in Christ in that capacity. And that becomes your mission field. That becomes your Jerusalem and Judea where you might serve under the Lord's care. So Jeremiah had this great decision to make to go to Babylon or stay in Jerusalem and he chose to stay for the sake of the Word of God and commit himself to the ministry of God's word among God's people. That being said, <laughs> things did not turn out entirely perhaps as Jeremiah had anticipated, nor as others had anticipated. <coughs> Sometimes after these great sweeping judgments of God come across our life, and, and you know, if you will, the, the deck has been cleared, uh, the floors that have been scrubbed, and everything looks like it's new and fresh, you got a brand new start at life, don't just assume that all is well. There yet remained uh, many snakes in the grass. There yet remained many dangers afoot. And the challenge here for Gedaliah, as he was appointed to the leader, was, I think, they had a little bit too much of a rosy optimistic view of what was ahead. And he was not sufficiently careful with regard to the citizenry that remained. He might have thought that the only reasonable thing now was to serve the king of Babylon because after all, how would we resist the king of Babylon now? If we couldn't resist him with our city in place and with all of our military all around us, how would we resist him now? So any resistance was futile. It's foolish. And Galileo said, listen, don't be afraid of serving the king. He'll take care of you. Plant your fields. Prosper. Build your farms. Build your life. Start fresh. Start anew. It was a grand vision, an optimistic vision of prosperity. And in fact, 
In very short order, they were uh, enjoying the fruit of the, the land and the wine and so forth. They were prospering. So God blessed the, the remnant that remained and provided for them. You know, after uh, the, the devastation caused by the Babylonian armies, there could have been tremendous continued famine and distress. God prospered these people that remained and provided for them in marvelous ways with the abundance of summer fruits. But Gedaliah had a little bit too rosy of you and didn't perceive the remaining corruption and darkness of the human heart. And this is something that we need to appreciate. That the human heart remains corrupt apart from the regenerating work of Jesus Christ and the transformation there are still those elements in the world that are corrupt. And we need to be always on our God. You see, Gedaliah should have been informed by his theology. He should have been informed by all the history of God's work among his people. And especially recent history should have warned him that there are still uh, problems within the hearts of the people. And so what seemed reasonable to him would not seem reasonable to those still in bondage to sin and rebellion in Christ, to Christ and his church. And so you have Ishmael, who comes up, who was a descendant of the Davidic line, and who perhaps had grand notions of his own uh, being put in a position of authority and power there. But those were foolish notions as became quickly apparent to him as after he had killed Gedaliah, he fled back to the Ammonites for safety there. So any plans he had to come into control of the land there were quickly abandoned after he committed his great evils. Even after he, in some respects, gained control of the area, he still fled. But the heart of man, apart from the regenerating power of the Spirit of Christ, continues to be corrupt and continues to be blinded by its own pride and aspirations. And Gedaliah should have been more careful and should have perhaps listened to what Yohanan uh, uh, said to him about Ishmael. Now, Yohanan's uh, advice here, first he, he, he was doing him a favor by alerting him in advance to what should have been known, apparently, by Gedaliah, that Ishmael was plotting against him. And so Yohanan was helping Gedaliah out here by informing him of this, but the, the manner in which he was going to solve the issue perhaps was not the most appropriate. He was going to assassinate Ishmael secretly. Well, that may not have been the best way to handle the situation, Ishmael could have been taken into custody uh, and questioned and so forth. But Gedaliah would not listen to uh, the uh, advice of Yohanan. Again, reflecting that overly optimistic point of view um, in, in Gedaliah's heart. We come to the end of the chapter with the, the death of uh, Gedaliah, and it, it comes in this remarkable way in, in, in which uh, Ishmael comes with ten men. They sit, sit at dinner with Gedaliah. He hosts them. Gedaliah is uh, good-hearted and generous in welcoming them, in spite of the suspicions that are in his mind. And then uh, Ishmael rises up and attacks him there. Now, why is this story important to us, and why is it presented in Scripture? What are we to gain from these things? Well, it's not just simply a, a story about the, the, the destruction of the city, the confusion that occurred thereafter, and, and the problems, that the moral issues that followed thereupon, and, and all the conflict that occurred. It's not really a historical report. It's intended to show us something of the coming of Christ. And, and Jeremiah's uh, uh, attachment to Gedaliah showed his commitment to Christ. Christ is in the camp of his people. Christ is united to his church. And his commitment to 
Jerusalem and Judea was this commitment more formally and directly to Christ himself. You remember uh, how Christ was dwelling among his people in a unique way that separated them from the rest of the nations of the earth. When Moses led Israel out of Egypt, the angel of the Lord accompanied them out of Egypt. And there, when they came to the Red Sea and Pharaoh was coming behind them with his armies to attack, you recall in Exodus 14 that the angel of the Lord goes from the front of Israel around to the back and stands between Pharaoh and Israel. And the angel of the covenant and the glory cloud come together, signifying a distinction there. It's the Son of God and His theophanic glory and with the Spirit of God in the midst of the camp. And the Son of God is with His people, defending them. And they get through the, 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 the waters there, and, and when Pharaoh tries to come across, they're destroyed. But the Lord was in their midst, and He continued to be in their midst. Later, when uh, the Israelites rebelled against God, uh, with Aaron and the building of the golden calf. Uh, God, Moses comes down in, in judgment, destroys the, the, the two tablets containing the Ten Commandments, and then afterwards he intercedes with the Lord for Israel. And he pleads with God that his presence would not depart from his people. God was present in a unique way with his people. And Moses understood that. That's why he left Egypt to be a part of Israel, because of the presence of the Redeemer. And of course, eventually in time, not only do you have the temple with the presence of God there, but you have the Davidic line and the promises of God that the Christ would come through David. And so it's with the people of God that the Christ would come. And Jeremiah identifies himself with this people and with this Christ. Now, in the course of that, Gedaliah, it seems to me, is in some respects one who, in a broken, fragmented way, shows us something of what would occur in the coming Christ. In that the Lord Jesus himself would come and offer peace to the people of God. And he would be betrayed by one who sat with him at table. Remember, Judas Iscariot sat with him at the table. And when everyone was asking, Lord, is it me, in terms of who would betray him, Jesus gave the bread to Judas Iscariot and says, go out, do what you have to do. <clears throat> Jesus would be betrayed by one uh, right there. And then he would be executed. <coughs> Even as Gedaliah would lay down his life. Gedaliah was a man of faith, a godly man. A man who had come to Jeremiah's aid in the past, who came from a family that had similarly committed themselves to the Lord. Shaphan, his grandfather, had helped Josiah in finding the, the tablets of the law in, in the, the temple there and instituting the reforms in Jerusalem years ago. Kenaliah was a godly man. And through him, God reveals to Jeremiah something of the work of Christ and does that for us as well. Jesus would lay down his life for his elect and be their savior. Now the consequences will follow up on in the coming weeks, but be reminded that the work of Gedaliah in the midst was accompanied with summer fruits with a great harvest. And think of the, the, the inheritance that God's people were receiving and the prosperity that they had. They, while they enjoyed these earthly things, we are shown that there are greater fruits for us in the kingdom of Christ our Lord. We have the fruit of the Spirit to develop within us. We have the riches that they provide in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and gentleness, self-control. All these many things are ours in Christ as we serve Christ in his kingdom. And so we all have a decision to make. You know, when we look at life and see all the many different decisions we have in the course of life, some major, some very minor, uh, we all need to look at these things 
with a deeper perspective. We need to drill down underneath the surface of life and look at the greater commitments that God requires of us. How does Christ want us to serve Him best in the choices that I have in life? Jeremiah had a decision, a decision before him which was between one path that was good and another that was perhaps better. And the better path for him was to stay in Jerusalem and to serve there. Eventually he'd be taken off to Egypt and die in Egypt. So Jeremiah would continue to serve in days of affliction. But it was his commitment to Christ that guided him in that decision-making process. And similarly, as we make decisions in life, the grand decisions, where to live, where, where to work, uh, who to marry, uh, where to send our kids to school, what church to attend, all these things need to be governed by our relationship to Jesus Christ and by his revealed will. And how may I best serve in Christ's kingdom? That has to be uppermost in our minds. Too often we simply make decisions based on what's good for me at the moment, what appeals to me at the moment. I face that all the time. I'm continually torn with different decisions to make. Should I trade in my old car for a newer model? Should I do this or that? You know, well, what is really important? What's truly of value? We all have to make decisions. But let them be guided by Christ and his kingdom, first and foremost. It doesn't mean we don't have care and consideration for our comforts, our joys in life. God gives us summer fruits. He gives us great blessing as we serve him in his world today. And we should enjoy that. But enjoy it in the context of serving Christ our king. And then those things will be truly joyful. A true lesson to us. Well, we'll continue on in the course of, of Jeremiah's uh, book here, but always, again, look to see what Christ is saying to us in the Scriptures. And what do the Scriptures say about Jesus Christ? They always have this greater interest in pointing us to Him and not leaving us merely on the superficial level of people and places and things to do and, and various events of life. Those things are important. They have a place. But most fundamentally, what is our relationship to Jesus Christ? What does he want me to do as his disciple? How should I best follow him? And he'll take care of us in the course of the way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the life of Jeremiah and the many things that he had to experience. We thank you that he committed himself to you and to your care in the decisions that he had to make for himself. And we thank you that indeed you looked after him and provided for him in different ways. Father, grant us grace that we too would commit ourselves to you and to your care in the various uh, changes of life that come our way. As we make decisions about a variety of things, Lord, help us to do so in faith, trusting in you, and waiting on you for your blessing and your provision. And grant us your blessing this day, we pray in Jesus' name.